Aloha, spooky nerds, and welcome to Talking Strange, a new paranormal and high strangeness podcast, part of the Den of Geek Network, where we introduce you to a world of weirdness. I'm your host, Aaron Sagers, journalist, author, researcher, and I can currently be seen on the Travel Channel and Discovery Plus series, Paranormal, Caught on Camera. So 20 years ago, on January 25th, 2002, the Mothman prophecies opened in movie theater starring Richard Gere and Laura Lenny directed by Mark Pellington. The movie eh, failed to make much of a splash critically or commercially, but it has developed a bit of a cult following as a creepy supernatural horror flick in the year since I personally, I like it. However, the Mothman prophecies movie was based on the 1975 book of the same name written by journalist and ufologist John Keel. The book focused on sightings during 1966 and 67 of a winged bird-like creature and other strange phenomena in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It really all began on November 15th, 1966, which is uh, about 11 years before my birthday, but the same day, in the small town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where two young couples, four people, fled the World War II munitions dump site, also known as the TNT area. And they claimed that they had seen and been followed by a terrifying creature. They did recount this story to the sheriff, and they reported that they saw this entity, and it looked humanoid, except it had massive wingspan, maybe up to 10 feet, and it had glowing red Eyes. The local headlines that came out the next day in the Point Pleasant Register. Couples see man-sized bird, creature, something. That was all the headline. The sightings then led up to the collapse of the Silver Bridge into the Ohio River on December 15th, 1967, just over a year after the sightings began. And that claimed the lives of 46 people. All right, that's all the setup. Before we get too far down this road, let's bring in a man who I deeply respect and I also call a friend who can speak to the weirdness of the Mothman. He is a well-recognized, highly sought-after investigator of UFO, paranormal, occult phenomena. He's been actively involved in the field of animalistic and paranormal research for more than three decades. And over the course of that 30 years, more than 100,000 people have attended one of his signature weird lectures. He has been a consultant for numerous companies, networks, NBC, a and Fox, Sci-Fi, Discovery, History Channels. He's been interviewed by the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. He's worked on multiple television shows, including Unsolved Mysteries, Sightings, Paranormal State, Ghost Stalkers, Paranormal Lockdown, Hellier, and Kindred Spirits. And currently, currently, he is the co-host of the What's Up Weirdo podcast with Jessica Napkin. His name is John E. L. Tenney, and let me bring him into the show. John Tenney. Aaron Sagers. How you doing? This is the this is the first talking strange podcast episode, and I couldn't think of a better or weirder guest to kick things off. Oh, I'm honored and privileged to be your first guest. Uh, I am honored and privileged to have you here, and let's dive right into the weirdness surrounding the Mothman. So, as you heard, I kind of set up a little bit of this story, and also, like, some of the headlines that followed in the in, in the days after that initial sighting included, Monster No Joke for those who saw it, and then Gigantic Fuzzy Bird Chases Auto in Storm. So, you kind of fill in some of the blanks here. Can you tell us a little bit about the sightings that gripped Point Pleasant and the surrounding areas? And then we'll go a little bit deeper into it. Sure. From what I heard you say, you recapped everything really well. Thank you. Uh, the The thing that has always interested me about Mothman, aside from it being a giant flying creature, allegedly, is that in many paranormal anomalistic cases creature sightings like this there is this initial burst of news coverage like you were talking about that is very sensationalistic and very headliney 
but then it burns out very quickly, mm -hmm. even though the incidents still seem to be occurring. People still start to see stuff. And I think most newspapers probably think, well, someone is glomming on to the original report to get their name in the newspaper, especially at that time in the 60s. The way we think about media is a completely different world at that time. And being in the local newspaper was a big deal. Sometimes that was the most famous someone was going to get. So of course, you're probably going to have some people that are maybe fabricating stories. But what it always interests me, what I was going to say is, you know, the Mothman Prophecy books takes almost 10 years to come out later. Uh, we forget about things like that because of the world we live in now. If there's an incident or a case or a creature sighting, it's reported on ad infinitum, ad nauseum immediately and on TikTok and Twitter, all of the, the social media sites. But at that time, you have someone like John Keel who looks back at this 10-year-old report and, and the incident that he uh, investigated, and he takes his time to tell the story. And I think that's something that, you know, is also is not only problematic, but it, it has its good points too, right? Like it's 10 years to research and investigate the sightings of this glowing-eyed, huge, leather-winged creature. Uh, obviously, 10 years later, it's people's memories don't get better. So that's the hard part of writing that story. Right. But but I, I do find it fascinating when you deep dive Mothman, we now are in a point where 20 years ago, people said, well, I could only find six newspaper accounts of this. And that was because newspapers weren't very accessible and you didn't have, you know, ar archival sites to look up newspapers. And now, so here we are in 2021 and we can track down you know 40 50 60 articles about mothman and realize that maybe this was even a larger thing than even keel knew about yeah and 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 before we even like get too deep into keel that what i find you know spinning off of what you just said what i find fascinating about mothman in particular is that you it's easy enough to find people Yes, saying, well, I also saw this thing or or more than 100 people reported seeing this this thing, whatever it might be. But in the case of the Point Pleasant area, we did have, yeah, like a lot of people coming forward, being documented in newspaper articles. It wasn't just this vague number that's hard to pinpoint. We we do have reports. I mean, by if November 16th is when the the report came out in the Point Pleasant Register. We then had uh, Mary Heyer picked up this story for the Ohio. Uh, oh, darn. I forget the name of her newspaper, but she picked up on it the next day, I believe. And then a couple days later, when the Gettysburg Times, they reported eight additional sightings. And that was in the span of three days. And then people were coming out saying, well, actually, I saw it the same day as these couples in a uh, Newell Partridge, I'm thinking in Salem, West Virginia. And that's also where we get the story of the, the missing dog. If, if I am correct, I think that was Newell Partridge. Yeah. And, and so a lot of people going on records with it. Well, okay. Before we, I, I want to get to Keel, obviously, but give me a little bit more of out of those reports, the characteristics that we are getting about Mothman. So, okay. Red eyes. Red eyes, red reflector-like eyes. I mean, I think Partridge even specifically said they looked like bicycle reflectors, the way that they... So red glowing eyes. And the thing that's interesting about that is, you know, zoologists who look at the case say, well, they were seeing eye shine, you know, from animals. Sandhill Crane. Sandhill Crane. is a popular like one. That. The the difficulty with that is in a lot of the cases, you know, uh, even though Partridge himself had a flashlight, when you look at the other cases, even the smaller ones, the eyes were glowing. They were independent of a light source. So that's not really eye shine. Eye shine is something you get when you have a flashlight or a light source. So glowing eyes, um, feathery to large leathery wings, uh, much taller than a human. So the thing that always fascinated too with when people talk about sandhill cranes or giant owls, you know, even calling it big hoot at a, mm. at a certain point that people called Mothman saying that this was just a giant screech owl. 
is you also have to look at the day-to-day -day life of witnesses and observers. And these are people who live in an area where there are owls and there are sandhill cranes and have probably grown up around owls and sandhill cranes. So to immediately brush off the actual person who was the witness of the event by a zoologist who was not there and has only ever focused on animals is slightly disconcerting and disingenuous to me because, you know, you we as researchers, we have to judge, engage from, you know, the experiences and the stories that are being told. But the actual witnesses can tell us what they think they saw. And so if they record, you know, a nine foot tall, black, leathery winged, glowing eyed creature, that does not sound so much like an owl. No. No, not at all. I mean, yeah, that's and, and even a yes, Stanhill Crane is quite large. But even if I don't live in the West Virginia uh, area, I know that a Sandhill Crane. Yeah, it's big. It's not it's not nine feet, seven feet. It's not going to be mistaken for what these people are saying. They are also and, and Sandhill Cranes are probably not chasing your car. They're probably not flying above your car trying to chase your car. And in the early reports with the couples, the they mentioned that it, it was moving kind of awkwardly at a run, I believe. But then when it finally flew, when it takes off, it kind of takes off in a, a straight from the ground to the sky. Uh, no, no run and no run and start uh, movement like a like a jetpack acceleration. Right. So the and then. Eventually, we get the idea of a sense of dread. Some people reporting uh, bleeding eyes after seeing it, problems sleeping. Is that that's kind of where we get to John Keel, right? That's he's bringing that that kind of uh, reports into it. Yeah, Keel starts to look at not only giant leathery winged glowing eyed creatures, but what are the other anomalistic and perhaps psychical or paranormal aspects that might be surrounding it, which me as a researcher, I've always found that when I'm investigating a case, it's one of the things I'm interested in too. If it's in the real world, let's assume it's in the real world. Are there any other effects that might not seem of this world that seem otherworldly? So do people have nightmares? We had a case in Michigan back in the 1990s where people were seeing this creature that they described as kind of a giant triangular hairy creature but if you deep dived the cases you found out that they all the people who had encountered this within the next six or seven days started having very vivid nightmares and keel was one of those people who said well is anything happening not only during the event but afterward even before, you know, there's kind of a, a precognitive effect. Did, did something happen similarly? And so Keel started looking at the incidents surrounding the days and weeks before and after Mothman and finding that there were, you know, seem, things that seemed to be, um, again, like I said, precognitory, that people started feeling senses of dread, that they started having nightmares, that people even started reporting really heavy cases of deja vu, uh, almost like time slips that they were having. And, and pretty quickly, Keel did connect with Mary Heyer, who I just, I, I love the, I love Mary Heyer as this, this older woman that was a reporter for Athens Register, by the way, that's, that was the newspaper she was with. They connected fairly early on and she was sort of, uh, well, she was not sort of, she was reporting on these incidents and also the eyes and ears for Keel on the ground. Just to backtrack a little bit here, though, uh, as you as we mentioned, the Mothman Prophecies book came out in 75. But prior to that, Gray Barker wrote the Silver Bridge book, and that was sort of the literary debut of Mothman, correct? So tell me a little bit about the differences in how Gray Barker and who Gray Barker was and how Gray Barker approached this topic versus Keel's approach uh, by the time he wrote his book. 
Well, Gray Barker was a researcher and investigator and author into high strangeness. He had been a ufologist for quite a long time. Uh, he was also, you know, known to be not the most trustworthy of sources. Uh, that's something that we all kind of know about now. Uh, and he even admitted to a little bit in his lifetime to amping up some of the stories. But I think what Gray found super interesting about the Mothman was Gray Barker when he was younger and years earlier than the Mothman. Gray had been uh, one of the lead investigators in the Braxton County monster, which is the Flatwoods monster, which is this giant nine to ten foot tall creature with glowing eyes. Um, that was written off as an owl. And, you know, Braxton County, West Virginia, is maybe less than two hours away from Point Pleasant. So I feel like with Barker writing about, you know, in the past, writing about the Flatwoods monster, Keel sees the Mothman, and, you know, there's this swirling of high strangeness, and it comes out with Gray writing The Silver Bridge, and talking about how people were also having encounters with men in black, which is something that he wrote about very often in the UFO days. And Keel goes to investigate Mothman. He has a lot of strange experiences during the case. And you get this confluence of high strangeness that just forms the basis for this really modern mythological tale of a giant creature. Yeah, and and <laughs> there's so much, so much with Mothman that it's there's so many connecting phenomena and elements to it which is part of the reason i love it but also what makes it frustrating to tell a straight linear story about uh the the mothman sightings but let's take a slight detour to men in black <laughs> yes uh, gray barker 14 years prior to writing silver bridge in 1970 in 1956 he wrote they knew too much about flying saucers and that's when not necessarily the first mention of Men in Black came about, but that really sort of solidified it within UFO lore. Is that correct? Yes. And again, you know, this is one of the things that I think is most fascinating to me about All High Strangeness and probably to you and your listeners as well. Is so, you know, you have Keel in 75 writing about Mothman, about this case that happens 10 years earlier, and Barker's also writing about Mothman. And then, you know, you have Flatwoods Monster, which is somehow interconnected to it, and the MIBs, which are somehow connected to it. And then 15 years earlier, Barker is writing about MIBs, which is telling the story of another researcher named Albert Bender, who is a UFO enthusiast and researcher who is encountering the men in black and the men in black are these dark figures with glowing eyes. And you see this repeating or almost archetypal pattern happening over and over again. And, you know, men in black, I would have never thought that you'd have major motion pictures about the men in black when I was growing up, but I never thought you'd have a major motion picture about Mothman. Uh, but it just shows that there's something deeply strange and perhaps each of us feels and, and understands that what seems to be our day-to-day -day life is far stranger than we give it credit for. And so when we read these stories and we start taking into account, uh, I think I saw this and I think I saw that, and we read about, you know, people have been having these strange experiences prior to us and they've been documented by researchers, that's, and then perhaps our encounters are somehow tied into these other encounters that are all tied into each other. There's this, we, we become part of the story, and I think that's very appealing to us as well. You know, the, uh, the, with the men in, men in black, they do supposedly arrive on the scene in the Point Pleasant area, and... Again, Mary Heyer is someone that even said that she had encounters with men in black. Just just for a very brief kind of description of these MIBs, we're not for anyone that may not know, we're not talking about the smooth Will Smith types <laughs> or even the uh, curmudgeonly Tommy Lee Jones types. And we're not even talking about th these. These aren't the cool, comedic, uh, maybe not even governmental uh, characters, right? Mary Heyer was encountering a very different kind of 
men in black and the other people surrounding this, the ones they were encountering were peculiar, right? Yeah. So men in black, traditionally, the kind of breakdown of what they were, men in black suits who a lot of the times in a lot of reports were bald, very smooth skin, spoke robotically, uh, asked questions and spoke in a manner which seemed like they didn't understand our language. They didn't understand things like, you know, uh, sugar and coffee. Uh, they didn't really understand how they were supposed to enter a house once they had knocked on a door or how they were supposed to sit on couches. The, they were always reported as seeming very robotic and very not of this earth. And again, really smooth skin, uh, weird voice affectations, uh, their eyes perhaps uh, slightly larger than normal eyes, and their ability to appear in a neighborhood or in a location and then not be understood how they left or got there. Sometimes they were seen in black cars with, you know, out license plates on them, but a lot of times they would just show up in a neighborhood, question people, uh, and then vanish. And <laughs> I recall... Uh, an account uh, very fascinated by everyday objects like a you know like a pen a, a a i think it was like a clicky pen or something um how did so how did they play into the events of point pleasant were they what were they doing when they were visiting eyewitnesses reporters uh also keel had his own uh encounters he claimed with them what were they saying in relation to the mothman sightings so it always seems like it's information gathering in some sense. Uh, in some cases, they do seem to be slightly threatening. Do not talk about this. Do not tell anyone about your encounter. Sometimes they seem to flash what look like official government IDs, but you know, no, they never give anyone long enough to actually look at it. Um, again, this is, you know, the 1960s and 50s when they showed up. So if someone showed up saying they were from the government, you just kind of took them at their word. But uh, a lot of the times it seemed like they were just testing people's memories and accounts of the situation and perhaps even trying to see if the person themselves, as, as we spoke earlier, if they actually had had a weird experience or were fabricating. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I look at too. You know, sometimes I think that the men in black, if they exist, uh, are perhaps as interested in Mothman and these weird experiences as we are, and they don't understand it either. And I, I want to get to that. I just, I, the thought that popped into my brain, and I hadn't really thought about this before, but when the men in black were very popular or when the sightings were kind of being popularized within UFO lore and then the Mothman uh, connection, if you know, it's the late 60s, Mothman emerges, uh, as I said, in the TNT area, er, area so the, the World War II munitions dump site. And then the MIBs are being spotted, you know, the beginning late 40s, popularized in the 50s and continuing the 60s. This is all pre-Watergate era when perhaps there was more trust in the government. You said you wouldn't really question the guy as the agent showing up at your door. Do you think do you think the the uh, the MIBs could really act uh, successfully operate in sort of the post Watergate era when all <laughs> trust in the government really went to crap. No, I, d I don't think it would work the same way. And uh, we don't exchange information the same way. I don't think they would have to. I think that there are so many people, if they had a weird experience posting it on Facebook, posting mm -hmm. it on Twitter, TikTok, that there's different information, data gathering, mining sources. But one of the small facts about MIBs that gets written off a lot of the time is to go back to the uh, Gray Barker book, They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, talking about Elbert Bender's encounter with Men in Black, is that with Men in Black, you also have Bender talking about the fact that the Men in Black showed up after he had done occult rituals. So... You know, his room was filled with a sulfur smelling smoke 
And that's when he first witnessed the MIBs in his room. And there were also not only men in black, but women in white that mm. he saw that don't get talked about as much. They didn't show up with, you know, Flatwoods or Mothman or anything like that. But there also seems to be an occult angle to this as well. Okay. <laughs> I have to I have to bring it back around a little bit, but with the and this is this is like why I love it and why it also blows my mind, but we so we have on the ground, we have in in the Point Pleasant area, we have or in the, the air. In the air, uh in the sightings taking place and then we have the MIB showing up multiple times throughout the area talking to eyewitnesses, talking to reporters. And then there's this other character that plays into the Mothman story, the sightings, and then is also referenced in the movie. And you know who I'm going with. Here we go. <laughs> As if occult men in black, women in white, the Braxton County monster Mothman isn't enough. You have a gentleman named Woodrow Derenberger who, while driving around al along the roads, uh, is stopped by a flying saucer and meets an extraterrestrial, allegedly named Indrid Cold. Right, uh, <laughs> and 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 yeah, November nineteen sixty six. So right around the every at, at the really at the beginning of all of this stuff, or or what we know to be to be the beginning of the sightings. So tell me about Indrid Cold and Woodrow, <laughs> and then how Keel got involved with sort of both of them well it's one of those things you know it's, it's it's interesting to me because cases did get around and so woodrow derenberger is driving on the road he has this encounter with an extraterrestrial uh he talks about it it gets reported he goes on some television shows and talks about it uh keel kind of realizes that this is perhaps interconnected to mothman uh the story kind of evolves that indrid cold is a extraterrestrial from a planet called Lanulos um, and is kind of an archetype of the Native American trickster spirit and mythologically the, the trickster itself. And so Kiel, who has a fascination with all of that stuff, Kiel's first book was called Jadu. Uh, it was written about, you know, Hindi mysticism. And so Kiel starts in uh in interviewing and, and talking to Darren Berger about Indrid. And, you know, at a certain point, believe it or not, and you know, you have to take people's at their word, you know, the Indrid is somehow involved in the Mothman. Uh, he starts uh you know, it's it's hard because the one thing that happens too is I think that Mothman Prophecies is a really good movie. Uh, but trying to tell the book, The Mothman Prophecies, in movie form is probably almost impossible to do. Uh, it's just so, it's like this conversation. It goes into so many different realms. How do you tell this story that, you know, just we in the past 30 minutes have gone from, you know, occult summoning of women in white to Indrid Cold, <laughs> an alien from Lanulos, and the Silver Bridge collapsing in Mothman. How do you tell all that in a, in a movie? I mean, it's pretty typical of a conversation with John Tenney. I will I will say that. It's the, <laughs> that, that part is expected. But yes, go on. But it's one of those things, too. Uh, unfortunately, I will say about Darren Berger is that I think that one of the biggest problems in investigating high strangeness is that when people do have an encounter or perhaps have had a real valid experience or experiences in the paranormal, uh, once that experience ceases, I think Keel even talks about this in, in some of his later books, perhaps The Eighth Tower, once their paranormal experiences cease, there's almost a drive in that person to have more. And so they will start to perhaps amp up their information, fabricate the, a little few more experiences. Well, then everything comes and is called into question because if you're willing to make stuff up later on, did you make up stuff in the beginning? And I, I don't think that is the case in Derenberger. I think Derenberger did meet someone that portrayed themselves as injured cold. And I do think that there were Mothman encounters. I just discerning what is real, what is fake, 
And then what is really fake and really real becomes even more difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, Indrid, or what we what is believed to be Indrid Cold, was also spotted by other people. I'm thinking most notably the there was kids that had gone by and seen i think he was in a metallic outfit of some sort uh and is sometimes referred to as uh, in later years i guess some people call him the smiling man the grinning um, man a grinning man and do you do you believe that that was perhaps they were seeing the same character that darren Berger saw uh i think that Indrid, much like the men in black, is probably archetypal. And mm -hmm. I don't know whether or not you're seeing... I, I even think that that's the same kind of thing with Mothman or or the Flatwoods monster, too. I think that these are probably forms that are being taken by things that don't have a form that we would recognize. And then once one kind of catches fire and has a personality, they're like, oh, I can be that form as well. You know, even the the fact that he comes to that Indrid comes to be known as the smiling man or the grinning man, you know, that again harkens back to you know trickster archetypes and mythologies that span hundreds, if not thousands, of years into the past. So I don't know if we're seeing the same thing, uh, but we are seeing something that is aware of our mythology and and our history. Mm -hmm. I just randomly thought about this. I, I You saw the series Loki, right? Yes, I did. I mean, Loki as D.B. Cooper. There's just like a a kind of I, I really loved that that particular moment. I mean, talk about trickster spirits and presenting themselves as uh, Loki. Tom Hiddleston would be the grinning man if we were going to be uh, casting this. Well, I mean, one of the things that I found really funny because I thought to myself, you know, they tied him into D.B. Cooper. Uh, when I was watching Loki and I was like, oh, it would be really funny. I thought to myself in the moment when I was watching Loki, it would be really funny if they tied him into Indrid Cold. And and like there was just a moment in my yeah. brain. And as I was thinking that moment uh, in the show Loki, uh, he appears in this other world, one of the last world that he goes to kind of at the end of the universe. And the ship from the Philadelphia experiment is there, the USS Eldridge. And I was like, oh, he has now been tied into the Philadelphia experiment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, there is a lot of great Easter eggs in that in that kind of final world scene. So uh, Keel did not relegate Mothman to Point Pleasant or as a singular entity, similar to what you're saying. He was actually seeing larger patterns, right? He was... Can you talk to us a little bit about the Garuda, the Thunderbird, the kind of the bigger patterns that Keel was seeing and then how that may have shaped some of the theories that emerged out of this book? Well, that's one of the things, too, like I was saying, you know, once you realize that you start to get. So I like personally, I'm in the midst right now of writing a book about some humanoid sightings that happened in Michigan a few years ago. And people keep asking me where the book is. And I keep telling people it's coming soon. But, you know, sometimes it takes a while to research a book like this because one of the things that Keel realized very early on and that I'm going through right now is that when you don't have a frame of reference for something that you're seeing, your brain tells you it looks like this. So. If someone, you know, Keel has to go back and look at people reporting giant owls or thunderbirds uh, or other winged creatures, like you said, he would call it the Garuda. But are they the same thing? Are they these archetypes? Uh, just personally, I'll tell you, like in my case that I'm researching now, uh, someone had seen what they described as a like three foot black triangle that had legs and little led lights on top of it and it was running through this neighborhood and it would run up the side of walls and it would jump from tree to tree and so when i was walking around the neighborhood asking people and not prompting them asking people if they'd seen anything strange in the neighborhood i ran across one gentleman who lived a couple blocks away from the original sighting and he, he said the only thing weird he had seen in the neighborhood was he saw a black cat one night that was on fire. Hmm. And 
in my brain, I have to say like, is that him not understanding the thing that he's seeing? Because to me, a black cat being on fire is almost and running through a neighborhood is almost as strange as a black triangle with little right. legs and LED lights on top of it. So this was one of the things that Keel had to deal with too, was when people are describing something, you know, we as human beings, we focus on the eyes. So you always get eye reports because we're always looking for a personification of, of something. But if it's dimly lit, you know, your brain starts to fill in information in darkness. And so like, are they actually seeing large wings on these things? Are they actually seeing feet on these things? And so he has to piece together, you know, are people having religious experiences? Are they seeing an angel? Because angels are described as winged and can fly. Uh, what is their religious background? What is, how does that influence the experience they're happening? You know, or did they see a petrosaur? Mm. Did they see a giant thunderbird? Which, uh, you know, the Native Americans in the day in that area had lots of legends about thunderbirds, giant, huge birds that that only showed up when it was going to rain. And and I love that because, yeah, we we place things within our frame of reference uh, with with what we understand. And I'm and I'm just looking around my my place right now and I'm seeing common objects that I'm used to, such as a tower fan that maybe 30 years ago nobody would have quite recognized and 50 years ago would have seemed like a very almost alien object uh that's uh about five feet tall you know it's a strange thing to have around what would have been the frame of reference for that back then versus now i would say oh it looked a lot like uh, i saw this strange thing it looked like a tower fan that's sitting in my my apartment i so i we do kind of describe things based on what we already know and, the, and i mean so if you take like you were saying technology now that's not understood but perhaps not not actually invented at the time i mean we have to think too if we're dealing if in some part if you want to get a little bit conspiratorial if you're dealing with you know government entities then perhaps their technology is a little bit you know they have stuff that we don't have yet and so like right now you can go on you know any website anywhere and you could buy a pair of uh like night vision goggles that have little light up sensors over the eyes. Uh, and that would seem like a very scary thing if someone saw that in 1960 and didn't know that the government had people walking around doing any, some kind of recon or something somewhere. Could look like gl glowing red eyes, glowing red eyes on someone's head. Yeah. They, well, with Keel being the main, again, if you, if you only see the movie, the Mothman prophecies, you're really just not getting the entire not even close to the entire story that keel tries to tell in his book because he goes into so many different directions and um even tracks patterns of sightings and everything the he did he did not go for a supernatural explanation with the mothman prophecies did he he was he was kind of thinking in terms of something and he didn't really go into strictly ufos or extraterrestrials correct you know it's weird because keel is one of the reasons i mean obviously being a researcher of that age some of his ideas about things are very problematic mm -hmm. if you read his books he talks about women in a very demeaning way yes yes um but the thing that I do find interesting about Keel is he is one of those researchers that, you know, his business card said, not an expert in anything. And he had stickers that he would give out that said, belief is the enemy. And so I think that it's even hard to pigeonhole what Keel himself was thinking about Mothman. You know, if you asked him about UFOs, he would tell you that UFOs probably were some kind of living creature in the sky that could communicate you with you psychically. But if you asked him, well, is it supernatural? He would say no, uh, that that stuff isn't supernatural. It's mm -hmm. just as yet undiscovered. And so even pigeonholing him into what do you think Mothman is? Is it a psychic construct? Is it a supernatural entity? Like, I think that he would say no. It was just something that we don't currently have a frame of reference for. But he didn't specifically just go with, I guess what I'm getting as the notion of the, uh, the interdimensional hypothesis, ultra terrestrials, things like that. He was, he was also thinking about things outside of what's out there in the sky. And also uh, he was thinking beyond 
angels, demons, and ghosts. Yes, for sure. And I think that a lot of that is colored too by the fact that Keel was friends with another researcher to bring up, Ivan Sanderson. Uh, and Ivan Sanderson was a zoologist, and Ivan Sanderson was very interested in the biological nature of creatures. And, you know, uh, Ivan Sanderson studied, uh, he was one of the first people on the case for the Braxton County Flatwoods Monster. He was there for the Hopkinsville Goblins case. And, Sanderson being a very well-respected zoologist at the time, you know, was along those lines too. Like what are, what are the biological possibilities that this is just a, a, a thing that we haven't discovered yet? Is there an actual creature that lives in, you know, the, somewhere in this earth that we don't have a, a good frame of reference for? Mm -hmm. And so about a, a year and a month after the couples saw this thing, this this Mothman, that's when the Silver Bridge collapsed. And it was a bridge that was built in 1928, and it connected uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia, with Galapolis, Galapolis, Ohio, mm -hmm. and Old Bridge. Definitely an old bridge. Not, yeah. not, not stable for the weight of modern cars, and certainly not when it was... When there was a lot of cars on the bridge during Christmas season. So the bridge is strained, collapsed, 46 people died. We kind of emerge out of this. Keel in his book talks a little bit about some sort of he he believed it was that the that it was Indrid, right? That he believed he was communicating with over the yeah. phone and that he was being warned of an assassination attempt. Right, that that Indrid was somehow trying to relay information to Keel that something was going to happen, which Keel took as an assassination attempt. Uh, but you know, over the years, and probably because of Gray's book, Keel decided that the warning was about the Silver Bridge. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of developed this notion of Mothman being this harbinger of impending doom a messenger of some sort do you do you think that so keel by the time he published prophecies he was kind of he had landed on this this idea that the mothman was connect the mothman sightings were connected to the bridge to a degree yes i think again though one of the aspects and i deal with this personally because in Detroit we have a little harbinger of of evil named the Nain Rouge but one of the things that I discuss with people is that because if these creatures exist uh we cannot discern their motivations mm -hmm. and so when we call something uh, a harbinger of evil uh that doesn't mean that the thing is evil uh if something is trying to warn you of impending disaster, that seems very good. That mm -hmm. that seems like a friend saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be going out. There's something bad is going to happen. You should take more care. And so the idea that something like Mothman is evil because it was warning people that something bad might happen has always been very strange to me because I've always seen that as if, if we are dealing with Mothman as a nature spirit or an earth spirit or, or something like that, uh, it's simply trying to protect us in that sense. Mm -hmm. And and we'll have to get into Nain Rouge at a, at a later a later time because that is a worthwhile topic as well. The the I mean, or, you know, from the perspective of if this was some sort of either superior intelligence or time traveler or whatever, I mean, what would we do? We would go back in the past and witness significant events. You know, we would watch it firsthand. What was what was the lead up to these events like? So simply because you're on the scene observing doesn't necessarily make you directly correlated to the event itself. Well, and to kind of bring it into pop culture, I was thinking a lot about Mothman and these exact things that we're talking about now, trying to discern the motivations behind something when I was watching uh, Star Trek Discovery, because there's a whole season about the Red Angel, this harbinger of evil that seems to be appearing and it's taking, it's showing up at critical moments in history. And the reveal of that is that it is not an evil thing. Mm -hmm. 
So this wasn't really the end of the Mothman. It wasn't as if 1967 came and went and then we were done with it, maybe for a bit of time. But over time, Mothman sort of gained uh, maybe I mean, let me ask you, was it because of the movie that he came back into Vogue? Was there basically a big chunk of time there where people in the mainstream weren't really, you know, uh, talking about Mothman, you know, maybe nearly 40 years of this. Yeah. I mean, you know, it finds its way interwoven throughout pop culture, you know, uh, after Mothman prophecies came out, you have some comic book appearances Mm -hmm. of Mothman in, in different comics. You know, there's a Ripley's believe it or not comic book that does a whole article on Mothman, at the time in the 70s, there were UFO comics that talked about Point Pleasant and Indrid Cold. Um, but X Files. X Files, for sure. Um, but yeah, you know, it's one of those. I, I think the movie really did relaunch it into people's brains. And not only that, it it, it really actually gave a large viewership to the kind of sketch of Mothman that we all see in our heads or online, this you know, giant black winged shape with, you know, giant circular eyes, which was actually popularized most by an artist named Gene Duplanter. He was like the first one that really drew the one that looks like it's got big shoulders and, mm-hmm. and big plate eyes. Gene drew that back in the in the 1960s. But yeah, the movie really kickstarted it. And again, with the rise and advent of the archiving of newspapers, once people started to delve into the stories, they found accounts of high strangeness creatures that could be applied to Mothman that even Keel didn't know about. And so when you start to uncover those things, that really does make you a part of the experience. But one of them that seems like it's become part of the modern Mothman lore is the Blackbird of Chernobyl. And there's different thoughts on it. I know Lauren Coleman uh, cryptozoologist and he, he's of the he's of the opinion that the blackbird of chernobyl really emerged directly out of the mothman prophecies movie and then although some people say that there were reports of this back in 1986 i'm curious to get your thought on that as well as the uh the freiburg 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 shrieker uh that supposedly people had accounts back to 1978 except there's again not this not to my knowledge this newspaper track record of some of these these things it's just oh yeah this has been talked about since the 70s or the 80s i mean give me your response on those yeah i think again we start looking at cases whether it be like a giant blackbird at chernobyl uh and applying it to the mothman that again is on us. That is looking at an experience and then placing it into the context of what we think we know about the past. And so saying, is that Mothman? And why isn't this a new thing? Like why it could possibly be something totally different, but because our brains want to classify, classify and organize all of the information, we say, maybe this is a reappearance of this old phenomenon when we might be missing the fact that it's brand new. Is Mm -hmm. there something else going on surrounding it that takes place before or after the experience that would define it away from Mothman? But because of Mothman's popularity and his rise in popular culture, uh, I mean, now it's unbelievable that you can buy as many Mothman shirts as you can buy or, you know, Funko Pops of, of Mothman. Like it's just there. And so, I feel like that's the limiting part of of Mothman is that people have these weird experiences, but because they have Mothman in their brain, they think I saw Mothman and then don't go beyond that. Right. Do you so then are there are there documented accounts of this supposedly in the lead up to the Chernobyl disaster? Some of the people that worked at the site had seen this large bird called the blackbird of chernobyl but are there documented accounts something written down somewhere prior to the mothman prophecies movie we're like going back to actual 1986 and the the time leading up to it documented accounts of this this phenomena 
not that i know of no yeah what about no. the 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 other one the the freiburg i'm trying working on my german here freiburg <laughs> schreiker I well like the, other, the, the thing that's weird too is you don't really have in the moment accounts but you have this thing that does tend to happen in weird phenomena where people will say you know this experience happened in 1978 uh, but I didn't report it until mm, 1999. Uh, and so you so allegedly you have something that happened before these weird experiences or, or tragedies happened, but you don't have an actual paper trail to it. You literally have to take someone at their word that they're telling you about a real experience that they're accurately remembering from 30 years earlier. So is the in, in 2011 and then 2017, 2019, we were getting these accounts in the moment accounts out of Chicago of this this what people are calling a Mothman like creature or Mothman himself making uh, a his his uh, his reemergence into society. This was happening 2011 and then at least through 2019. What were your thoughts about that did that fit the mold of the mothman do you and yeah what are your thoughts about that it, it fit the mold of uh, a trickster entity for sure because a lot of the reports were coming out of the same source uh when you tried to check up on those sources the sources didn't check out so great um you could call up a few witnesses but maybe not as many as were being reported uh, a lot of things were being submitted just anonymously through websites and they were all coming through, you know, one or two sources. And so, you know, again, what you were checking up on, if you, if you were reading all the accounts, you were like, wow, all these people are seeing this stuff. It must be in the newspapers somewhere, but then you check the newspapers and the newspapers are simply reporting on the website where you find the original mm -hmm. accounts from. And so that gets harder and harder track. That's the thing that I'm dealing with now with my humanoid sightings studying in Michigan is that you have me and you have the witnesses, but you don't have any newspaper accounts of it. And so how can I factualize and document that these aren't just made up things that people were actually experiencing them? And I feel like, especially in this day and age, if people start seeing Mothman in Chicago in, in 2018 and they're seeing them at such a huge rate that, you know, it becomes part of the narrative of Mothman. You go back to this. I do at least go back to this idea of like, well, there should be then people I can interview and there should be footage and, 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 you know, places I can go to check the information. And those seem to fall by the wayside. So I'm a little iffy on Chicago Mothman. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, I think the equivalent that I that I could draw is that, you know, when a vocal minority of a fan base dislikes a movie, they make enough of a, a noise on social media or whatever, and then the media outlets get into covering that, and then the bigger major media outlets get into covering those smaller media outlets, and then suddenly you're elevating it, it becomes a thing, and then it, it adds this this air of legitimacy to the entire story, even though it was only essentially a handful of people making a big deal about that movie. And it becomes very difficult as a researcher to track back the original sources because newspapers are quoting newspapers and uh, they're quoting themselves in some instances. Mm -hmm. And we also live right now in a society much more, I think, than ever before, where people want to be part of the experience. And so if someone is walking along the shores of Chicago and they see something strange in the sky and they, you know, whether it's a, a balloon or a Mothman, like they snip it to tip, TikTok and throw it online and say, it's Mothman. Mm -hmm. And then you can add that to the information that's already aggregating somewhere and say, look, it really is happening when you know, people just want to be part of the story and have opportunity to do so now. Well, as we wind down, uh, well, actually, I I don't know if I asked you directly. Do you like the Mothman Prophecies movie? I do. I enjoy it. I own multiple copies of it. <laughs> it's It's got definitely a a kind of a creeping dread about it. It's it's definitely an eerie movie, I think. Yes, uh, I think it 
does a good job of crafting a, a, a scary, creepy, unnerving narrative. Yes. Yeah. They're not traditional, not a traditional one. It's not like by the end of the movie, we have the, uh, and, and I don't think we're giving any spoilers away for a 20 year old movie, but <laughs> it's, it doesn't wrap up in a nice little bow. It's, it doesn't. And the thing that I was always really impressed about, I remember going and seeing Mothman prophecies in the movie theater and I sat down and I can remember having this thought, which was prepare yourself to see the worst, uh, CG giant feathery Mothman mm -hmm. in the world. And the thing that I really appreciate about Mothman prophecies was that you get a very ethereal, uh, non-physical entity of mothman and i actually really appreciated that and it did a hell of a good job selling chapstick well at least for me <laughs> it was it was probably the i think one of the better product placements in a movie um i i also think that that movie uh you know and because of keel's influence obviously but i think that movie uh, damaged a lot of paranormal investigators to always be slightly just a fraction of a section of suspicion when a paranormal investigator is in a hotel room and a phone rings <laughs> <laughs> uh what what if you were going to be an advocate or if you were going to what, what do you think people get wrong most get get most wrong about mothman stories well if you were going to be the public ad public advocate for Mothman. What would you try to correct in the in the story and the narrative about Mothman or Moth people? Uh, I think what I said earlier. I think what I would try and do is correct the narrative that we have this innate desire as human beings to understand the motivations of people and entities around us. And I think that that is very egotistic of us to do. Uh, and if we are dealing with an anomalistic, strange, supernatural, interdimensional, hyperdimensional, ultra terrestrial creature, we probably don't understand their motivations. And so to just ascribe to them evil, uh, demonic, terrible, nightmarish powers, I, I think is a disservice to the high strangeness of the universe. After after the movie came out, shortly after the town of Point Pleasant, they launched the festival. They had they erected the statue, and now twenty years on, it it seems really like Mothman is having a moment. I can't tell you how many Etsy shops are selling Mothman related products. It's you know cutesy Mothman. It's it's so Mothman's having a moment. Why do you think that is? What is it about Mothman that really speaks to us? in the last couple of years and in 2022 as this poster child for weirdness and for pheno paranormal phenomena? That's actually a really good question. I, I don't know why Mothy has, has kind of caught on. I think it's because, you know, there are, whether it's Bigfoot or Mothman or, or Chupacabra, there's not only a fascination with strange creatures, but if I really deep dive in my head and I'm really doing that now in the moment, I think it's because those characters can also be very easily turned into cute versions of themselves. Mm. You can make a plushy Bigfoot. You can make a plushy Mothman. You can make a tiny Funko Pop of Chupacabra or Bigfoot. Like they can become something that is not ethereal and is cute. They can become mm -hmm. something that's not frightening and impending of doom or, or challenging to your whole sense of reality. They can become this cute, fuzzy little friend that you keep with you uh, that is strange and misunderstood. And I feel like perhaps internally, that's how we all feel, strange and misunderstood. And so to have someone like that in your house with you makes you feel a little bit better about yourself. I, I agree with that. I I do wonder if also part of it is a willingness or reflecting perhaps a broadening of horizons of expansion of, of what, where we're willing to go collectively. And I know we've talked a little bit about this before that I think people are kind of willing to go there a little bit more with, with really crazy stuff beyond the ghosts and beyond the aliens and maybe even big beyond the Bigfoot. Yeah. Um, 
they give the world a little bit more color, a little bit more vibrancy. And, you know, you can get, when you're talking about UFOs or you're talking about ghosts, ghosts get wrapped up very immediately with death, which is not something that we like to sit around our houses and ponder. Uh, it sits in the back of our brain forever anyway and is uncomfortable. UFOs gets tied up with uh, our aloneness in the universe and are we alone? And I mean, and then you have things like Mothman and Bigfoot and they're here with us and we're not alone and they're as strange as we are. And that, again, like I said, is kind of comforting. Yeah. Well, as far as uh, comforting, I've had a very comfortable time talking <laughs> to you. That was a that was a terrible segue. I was working <laughs> on a transition, you know, and it just didn't pan out. But with that said, uh, how can people support your work and keep up on all things John Tenney? Uh, they can find me on social media. All my social media is John E L Tenney. That's Twitter and TikTok and Instagram. Or my website is weirdlectures.com. And once a week, they can listen to me talk to my friend Jessica on the phone at What's Up Weirdo, available in all of their podcast formats. And I know I'm going to get in trouble if I do another interview with you without bringing on Jessica. She's going to be very upset but we'll we'll have to do that we'll have to have a, a weirdo talk with that said john tenney my friends uh and just one of the most fascinating people that i can talk to i'm very grateful for your time and thanks for uh geeking out and talking strange about mothman with me thanks for having me Aaron. it's always a pleasure <laughs>